This is a production of Cornell University. Uh, Nick uh, did his work in uh, Kevin Reeson's lab. Uh, he went to his hometown in Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, Nick will actually graduate next December. He keeps uh, apologizing for not having all of his data, but as you'll see, it's a very impressive data set he's already got in great experimental design. Um, after graduation, next December, he plans to work until about August, where he'll start a uh, PhD program, which he'll apply for next fall. So his, his talk is Morphological Adaptations to Climate Change in Oaks. Quercusville species. Genus. <laughs> the Latin name in there. <laughs> All right. Hi, everybody. My name's Nick, and um, this is a project that I've been working on for about the past year now. And as Mike said, I'm going to continue to work on it uh, over the summer and into next semester. And it's part of my honors thesis here, and I've been working on it with, with uh, Kevin Nixon. Um, so as Mike mentioned, I... Um, and still in the process of continuing on this project. So this is ba basically just a status update of where I am and where I plan to be in the next year. Um, and as a quick outline, today I'm going to talk about um, just an introduction and the goals of the project. So uh, what we're trying to do and how we plan to do that. And then some of the methods that we're going to um, and that we have been using over the last year and how those methods are um, aligning with some of the methods that have been used in the past and maybe some new things as well that haven't been used. And then also mention some of the results that we expect to get and some of the future work uh, over the summer and the next semester. So as an introduction, uh, it's important to note that there has been a really strong correlation between leaf shape and climate uh, for several, several decades. Ecologists and botanists have noticed that um, leaves that are, uh, for example, thin and highly dissected or highly toothed, have highly toothed margins, are more often found in the northern, more temperate regions of the United States or of the world. Um, and leaves that are thicker and with entire margins are often found in wetter, uh, more tropical climates. And also leaves that are much smaller, thicker, and maybe are more spiny are found in, in dry climates and, and desert, desert habitats. And these correlate, there's, a lot, there's several hypotheses that uh, can tell us why leaves are shaped this way and the correlations that, that go along with uh, climate and the morphological variation. Uh, but a lot of the previous work is just focused on these general characteristics of leaves. They've looked at leaf shape and um, maybe deciduous versus evergreen characteristics. But this project, in this project, we plan to look at some characteristics that are going to be a little bit more specific and maybe tell us a little bit more about the adaptations that leaves have to climate and maybe allow us to make some hypotheses about why leaves are shaped the way they are. So the inspiration for this project came from a pretty simple question. And that's why are oak leaves shaped so differently? If you guys have any experience um, with uh, oak taxonomy or oak morphology, then you've noticed that there's a huge variation in the shape of their leaves, the habitats they occupy, and, um, and their lifestyle as well. So we wanted to uh, try to answer that question. And in doing that, we hope to achieve a few goals. And the first goal is to determine the leaf characteristics in oak leaves that are most adapted to certain climates. We want to make some really specific and precise measurements to be able to make hypotheses about why leaves are shaped the way they are and hopefully correlate that to the specific climates they occupy. And we can also develop methods um, that can be used for other, morpholo other morphological studies and other taxa. Uh, so we're going to do uh, a lot of digital morphological measurements that can hopefully be not only used for oaks, but maybe other taxa in the future, and then can also be applied to things like uh, niche modeling or uh, taxonomic purposes so that we can better understand um, how morphology relates to adaptation and, and habitat preference. And then we can also uh, use these correlations that we, that we find to improve our predictions about, about paleoclimate. So for example, if we know that the flora of a certain area has leaf characteristics um, of, a certain, of a certain type, then we can look at a, a fossil flora and make correlations between uh, the leaves that we see today and the climates they inhabit and the paleo climates um, of, that, of the time when that, when, of those fossil flora. Um, so why do we choose oaks? Well, they've got a really immense and diverse morphological, geographical, and, um, and habitat preference. Um, as I mentioned before, they um, are extremely diverse. There's over 400 species of oaks, and they range from um, enormous deciduous trees to evergreen rhizomatous shrubs. 
and they have habitats ranging from uh, the northern temperate climates into the, into the subtropics and tropics. Um, and their leaf morphology is, is equally as variable. So uh, looking at variations in leaf size from some of the extremes here over to some of the smaller leaves here, uh, leaf shape, uh, there's uh, lobed margins, you see entire margins, um, you see deep, deeper lobed margins with, with uh, many spines, and the variation is, is really immense that you see, see in oaks, and it's, it's no surprise that they also have a really broad geographical distribution. So you'll see them from uh, southern Canada all the way into the subtropics and tropics of uh, northern South America, and also uh, from coast to coast in the United States. And this is, um, this, all, this is also a testament to the diversity of habitats that, that they occupy. So you'll find them in um, temperate, cooler regions in the north, uh, drier regions in the southwest, and um, wet, even cloud forest regions in the, in the subtropics and tropical, tropical locations. So based on their diverse morphology, their geographic, wide geographical distribution, and their um, really broad habitat uh, ability to add a, adapt to different habitats, they make an ideal group to study these correlations between morphology and climate. And in addition to that, um, we also happen to have, let's see, not wanting to go, Hmm. There we go. Yeah. In addition to that, we also happen to have uh, the largest collection of oaks in the world at the, um, at the herbarium here at Cornell. Uh, we, have, um, we have a collection of over 230 oak species uh, and over 13,000 database accessions of, of oak specimens. So this really makes it for an ideal group to study to, um, to work on this project. So on to some of the methods and how I plan to uh, look for these correlations and, and measure these, uh, these differences. Uh, we can do a lot of the work that I've been talking about with basically just herbarium specimens. And using an herbarium specimen, we can take a look at the label and get collection information on where that specimen was uh, collected. And we can pinpoint that on a map with a latitude and longitude coordinate. And once we have latitude and longitude coordinates for the entire species or for the entire um, for the entire species of, of our collection, then we can map those, um, map all of the species onto a map and, and produce a range map of, of that species. And then we can take the specific uh, coordinate for the species of or the specimen of interest, and we can look at the specific climatic conditions that that specimen um, was was in when it was collected. Uh, and then we can go back to the original specimen and take. Take a look at the uh, take a look at the leaf characteristics and make make some really detailed and precise morphological measurements. And putting all these things together, then we're able to take geography, climate, and morphology, and put that into one framework that we can be able to use for comparisons and to be able to make hypotheses about how these leaves are adapting and surviving in these different habitats. So to go into a little bit more uh, detail, to do the geo referencing, we're using a software called GeoLocate that was produced by uh, Tulane University. And this is, this is uh, like I said, just taking information right off that herbarium label and typing that right into this uh, software interface um, in, in the geolocate software. And usually you can get uh, a, a pretty accurate estimation of where that specimen was collected. Uh, for example, this one says, I don't know if you can read it, but it's San Bernardino National Forest uh, near Route 38. And the point comes uh, really near, near to that uh, string that you typed in, and it prints out a latitude and longitude coordinate for you to um, automatically apply to that specimen. Um, but it's, this is not always the case. There's always going to be some uncertainty with, your, uh, with the collection information on the label. For example, sometimes the collector will write 10 miles west of Sedona, and with that you don't have much, much uh, precision, and you've got to make a, a pretty broad estimation about where that specimen was located. And in addition to our collection in the herbarium, uh, we can also use uh, GBIF, which is the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. And this is a database, an online database of uh, nearly 2 million species and uh, I think over 700 million individual specimens that have been geo-referenced and databased in a similar way as this. So we can mine that data and be able to um, compare that to the data that we're collecting in the herbarium and um, also to uh, field studies that, we'll, that I'll be doing in the summer. And to eliminate the uncertainty with some of the geo-referencing, uh, the best way to do that is to go and make field collections with precise um, geographical coordinates and, um, and better uh, collection information on, on the specimen. So that, that is going to be done this summer. And to access climate data, we're going to be using WorldClim, 
which is a global, which is the world's largest global climate database, and it contains over 40,000 weather stations across the world. Each of these red dots on the map represents a uh, individual weather station, and this database produces an interpolated uh, continuous grid of climate data such that you can input any latitude, longitude coordinate and get a unique um, climate uh, profile for that latitude, longi longitude coordinate. And there's uh, a variety of climatic variables that, will be, that are presented in this uh, database, including um, variables on precipitation, temperature, and um, several other different variables as well. And to do morphological measurements, we're going to be using the online herbarium database that we, uh, that we have access to. And this is just an example of what the page looks like. And uh, this is several different specimens of one specific species. And you can go ahead and choose one species. And um, embedded right into this, um, into the herbarium database website, we have implemented um, a system of um, morphological measurements so that we can, uh, right, on the, right on the database, be able to measure things like petiole length, leaf length, uh, leaf width, distance to the, to the widest point, um, perimeter of the leaf, surface area of the leaf, and even you can count the number of primary and secondary veins. You can measure vein angle, and you can count and measure the depth and degree of spining and lobing on all of the leaves. So uh, this is really going to make the morphological measurement process ex uh, extremely uh, efficient and quick. And not only that, it's going to allow us to have sort of a digital uh, paper trail of every single measurement that we make such that every measurement will be instantly updated and correlated to that specimen and locked to it. Um, and if we need to go back and modify measurements or review the measurements that we made, we can always do that because this um, measurement system is embedded in the herbarium database and we'll be able to have that all connected and um, correlated at, at all time. So this is a, um, a big jump or a big change from the previous ways of just measuring leaves with a, with a ruler or with, with, um, with old instrumentation. Uh, so once, once we collect uh, a lot of the data, then we'll have a large matrix that includes several different species. These are the ones I've been working with uh, recently, and they're mostly western oaks. The numbers beside them indicate the, the number of specimens we have databased and imaged in the herbarium right now. Um, and then, as I mentioned, we'll have several different morphological characteristics that we'll measure as well, and uh, a host of climatic variables that will be correlated to each individual specimen. And then we can go ahead and make some... Um, uh, attempt to make correlations and do some analyses uh, between the different species, which will look at uh, some of the different adaptations and uh, some of the different characteristics of these species that are allowing them to adapt and occupy different habitats. Then we can also look at variation within species that will maybe tell us something about phenotypic plasticity and uh, some of the variation that we see in, in individual plants. And then we can take the whole matrix and look at variation across space and time. Uh, so looking at how these things vary with geography and over time as well, because we have a collection that ranges um, in the herbarium of over uh, 150 years of, of collections of specimens. So being able to do all these will um, hopefully um, lead to some conclusions that will support our hypotheses. And the expected results that we hope to see here, uh, definitely we want to see some, some type of correlation between morphology and climate. And there's been a lot of, like I mentioned, a lot of correlations in the past that have made between lobing and, and toothing of leaves. And we hope to make, uh, come up with something that's a little bit more specific and maybe a little bit more applicable to oaks. Um, and then we also hope to, um, min hope to improve the phylogenetic and taxonomic resolution of oaks. Uh, the phylogeny of oaks is notoriously unresolved and very uh, difficult to, to interpret because of uh, a large degree of phenotypic plasticity and hybridization within the genus. So being able to make these um, precise and efficient morphological measurements may improve the, the phylogeny and taxonomy of the, of the group. And then we also hope to maybe improve niche modeling methods. And niche modeling in the past has basically just, just used um, geographic distributions of species to uh, estimate the ranges of where those species um, habitats are. But if we can implement morphological characteristics that correlate with climate into those niche models, we may be able to better understand uh, why and how some species adapt to certain, certain regions. And in the future, uh, a big portion of this summer is going to be devoted to uh, a plant collecting trip across the southwestern U.S. into California and up into the northwest to document, collect, and photograph several different oak species to not only make 
uh, comparisons to some of the geo-referencing and um, the already collected specimens that we have, but also to improve the data set and add to the herbarium collection that we have here. And in doing that, I'm uh, going to use this Um, this is a, a prototype plant press that I hope to help out with the collections, and I'm calling it the Plexi Press. So it's just basically two sheets of plexiglass uh, that you can carry in the field. It'll be light and easy, and it'll allow uh, imaging, uh, and it'll be able to be scaled, and then those can be uploaded to uh, the Herbarium website, and measurements can be made throughout the summer. And in addition to that, we can also hopefully improve the morphological measurement interface uh, so that we can uh, make, make better and more precise measurements as we go on. So to wrap up, uh, I've got to have a big thanks to Kevin Nixon, who is my research advisor, who uh, supported me a lot throughout this, uh, this project. Also to Anna and Peter in the herbarium. Uh, they've been a huge help throughout the whole, uh, the whole process. And also to the Plant Science Committee, Elena, Chris, and Mike, uh, for helping out with presentation and advice. And two undergraduate research grants that have, are going to support the summer collecting trip. So thank you. Questions? Yep. So, look around here, we have like chestnut oak, white oak, and red oak, and they all have very, very different leaf morphology. And yet they're co occurring, like in the day. So, how does your hypothesis sort of work, or what scale is it working at? Yeah, so, so they definitely co-occur in this area, but they may have ranges that differ. So you may find that chestnut oak has a range that's not the same as a white oak or a red oak. So if we can use um, collections from across that range and be able to correlate those characteristics to uh, different areas, then we can maybe come up with better hypotheses about why they have the shapes they do. Yep. So along the same lines, the phenotypic plasticity along that range has to confuse issues. Yeah. The phenotypic plasticity is huge. Yeah. So how, so how, do you, how does that, would it be better to look at phenotypic plasticity with any given species so that you have the species constraint rather than the, the problem that Marvin was talking about where you have overlapping ranges but there's a genetic component that gives you different morphology rather than a physiological adaptation to the environment? Yeah, absolutely. So that's something that I think is possible with this project. So the fact that we're going to have so many sample, such a large sample size for each species will allow us to do that within species comparison and among species comparison. Yep. I'd say yes, and especially so with oaks, even, even more so with oaks. Um, you can look on, on one oak branch and see leaves that have really distinct morphologies. And uh, in the field this summer, that's going to be hopefully avoided by making collections that are standard uh, with, with methodology that's standard along each, each specimen and individual. So, yep. So are like machine learning or deep learning approaches be used to try to model these? Because I mean, I agree, trying to standardize it one way, but the other way would just be to collect millions of leaves and let the machine learn. Yeah, absolutely. So I think that's maybe the ultimate goal is to get everything automated, just so you can uh, take a picture of a leaf or take a picture of a thousand leaves and put them through an automated system to come up with all of these morphological characteristics. And uh, I think that, yeah, that would be the ultimate goal. But for now, it's just done by hand. I mean, I think even right now, just look at leaf, photographing leaf litter and processing it would not be that part. That's a well known technology. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.